the merry bubble and joy, the thin, clear, happy call of the distant piping. Such music I never dreamed of, and the call in it is stronger even than the music is sweet, for the music and the call must be for us. I really love you, and I mean you. The star above you, crystal blue. was one of the most unique talents to surface from the 1960s underground music scene. His dramatic rise to stardom and mysterious untimely departure from public life is now the stuff of folklore. Underneath his erratic charms is a body of work and a personality that has made his legacy live on, even though Barrett himself has been conspicuously absent. There's no doubt that genius is madness. It's a, a type of abnormality that a lot of people never relate to. Uh, does Sid Barrett fit into being a genius? I would say absolutely. Extraordinarily gifted songwriter and a very talented musician. In his music, it didn't follow, I mean, even the simple songs, they, they, they don't really follow straight, a straight path of other songs. You warm to him, really, whatever the song, or whether it's some silly song like Bike or Jug Band Blues or Octopus, whatever he's singing about, you're drawn to him. He's a very attractive kind of personality. This film is an exploration of Sid Barrett's short recording career and the music that made him famous. the advancements and turbulence of the mid-1960s, British popular music was going through an important change. Leading bands like the Beatles were starting to adapt their American R&B influences and move in an entirely new musical direction. As the West Coast hippie movement began to take hold on youth culture, a young psychedelic band led by art student Sid Barrett began to emerge from the London scene. They became known as the Pink Floyd. The story goes, Sid comes into college one day, says, right, I've got a name for the band, Pink Floyd. Um, and supposedly, this comes from um, an old blues LP, which in the liner notes, it mentioned two, I think, Carolina blues guitarists called Pink Anderson and Floyd Council. <laughs> Sid Barrett's influences are very hard to track down because he remains unique and individual as an artist. But you can hear certain things. There was obviously an influence from Bob Dylan. to any of the, the bands that Sid has said that he was sort of into. And they were all bands that were kind of a little bit rebellious. Certainly characters like Dylan and Zappa, they're people who really stand on their own. Um, and I think you can see a lot of that in, in what Sid did. The group had begun by playing R&B covers, but it was through their live performances that their sound really began to develop. They were playing gigs and basically to cover their own sort of 
not lack of ability, that's the wrong word, but they found them, you know, they, they used to sort of do long, weird sort of freak outs in the middle of numbers. So they'd be doing a straightforward number like Louie Louie, bog standard R&B song. And then they put this huge improvised sort of splurge in the middle, basically. And the psychedelic thing for Pink Floyd evolved out of that. They became the kind of house band, really, for this, this burgeoning counterculture. Drugs were part of it as well. Uh, poetry, music, uh, all these forms of creative expression. And uh, with this sort of challenge to the existing mores and conventions of the day. A lot of people in the British psychedelic movement in the 60s had grown up with the R&B boom, with the Mersey beat and so forth, the sound that really defined pop at the beginning of that decade. But as the decade wore on, they suddenly began to realise there's more to music than just strictly three minutes, happy, happy, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, songs in the charts. And once they realised that, everything began to take off. Quickly attracting the management of Pete Jenner and Andrew King, Pink Floyd became increasingly successful on the new London Underground. They became a regular feature at the legendary UFO Club on Tottenham Court Road. It was here that they met Joe Boyd, who agreed to produce the group's first record. Suddenly there was a lot of interest came through very quickly. People wanted to book them and you know, record labels were starting to sort of approach them. They had Joe as a producer because they knew him, he was a mate, and he knew Sound Technique Studios. And so they went into Sound Techniques and did the did the two recordings, Arnold Lane and Candy and the Current Bun. The story is originally it was originally recorded as a demo tape to tout around the record companies. Arnold Lane had a strange the demo tape worked, and Pink Floyd were quickly signed to EMI. The Boyd-produced version of Arnold Lane was released on the 11th of March 1967. Arnold Lane was an interesting choice because it didn't quite have the psychedelic overtones that they had become associated with playing at clubs like UFO. It didn't have all of those sort of... I mean, in a way, perhaps it couldn't. It's a three-minute single. I mean, the, 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 the other side of the Floyd was the 20-minute the space jams uh, when everybody's high on LSD. Uh, to compress what they do into a three-minute single, um, I think it's a remarkable piece of work, actually. Arnold Lane was the first hit single for the Pink Floyd. It fitted into what was going on at the time, and it didn't fit into what was going on at the time. There was a certain darkness and eeriness and eccentricity to it. It had a real edge. What the Floyd seemed to be doing was taking the classic rock and roll or pop structure musically and playing around with it. They were messing with your head by knocking it around. So you ended up with something slightly skew with, but something that still had enough in there to appeal to the masses. Very clever balance. For a hit single in 1967, you know, everyone else is still singing love songs and still covering songs by American groups. And then you've got this pop single that was about a guy in Cambridge stealing knickers off his neighbour's washing lines. Um, so it, it, it obviously a very, very atypical um, and very English sort of, sort of subject matter for a, for, for a pop song. So it kind of broke the mould in that sense. I mean, this character, Arnold Lane, is, is a totally non-threatening character. OK, you know, he <laughs> takes brass and knickers off washing lines, but there's no suggestion that he's some kind of evil predator playing on young girls or anything like this. There's a kind of innocence about it. Interestingly, the story is that it's very much rooted in real experience, and, and Sid Barrett's mother, and I think maybe Roger Waters' mother, uh, at home in Cambridge, let rooms to students, female students at the university. And so there was always this line of bras and knickers hanging in the back garden. And so the sort of seed of the song is there. A nasty sort of person.
Gold Lane became a big success, reaching number 20 in the UK charts. In contrast to more recent times, the Barrett of 1967 was every bit the pop star, fronting many live performances and even appearing on television. Sid Barrett was a pop star for a while. He fronted the band and he was obviously very happy doing that. You know, he had real stage presence. I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen that bit of footage of them on, on Look of the Week doing Astronomy Domine with the sort of flailing arms and all that sort of thing, you know. He certainly had that side to him, this sort of... Um, limelight-seeking, centre-of-attention kind of side. Why has it all got to be so terribly loud? For me, frankly, it's too loud. I just can't bear it. I happen to have grown up in the string quartet, which is a bit softer. So, uh, why has it got to be so loud, so amplified? Well, I don't guess it has to be, but, I mean, that's the way we like it. And uh, we didn't grow up with a string quartet, and I guess that could be one of the reasons why it is loud. I mean, it doesn't sound terribly loud to us. Yes, actually, not everybody who hasn't grown up in a string quartet turns into a loud pop group, so your reason is not altogether convincing. But I accept that you like it. What I'm saying is that if one gets immune to this kind of sound, one may find it difficult to appreciate softer types of sound. Sid, yes? No? I don't think that's so. No. Uh, I mean, everybody listens. We don't need it very loud to be able to hear it, and with some of it is very quiet, in fact. Right. I, I th personally, I like quiet music just as much as loud music. We play in large halls and things where, where obviously, volume is necessary. And when people dance, they like uh, volume, you know, comes in uh, on its own, but... Uh... Barrett's next composition, See Emily Play, was to further establish him as a pop star. However, the record did not start out with such ambitions. See Emily Play started as a song called Games for May, which is a line in the song. And that was written uh, for an event on the South Bank in London at the Festival Hall called Games for May uh, in May 1967, which was perhaps the first time the so-called underground came, if not overground, a little bit more into uh, uh, the, the, the public focus. But it was the first major sort of visible coming together of the tribes, if you like, that represented the, 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 the London underground scene at that point. Um, so that's how the song started. Um, and then uh, it developed from Games for May into See Emily Play. <laughs> Understands. She's often inclined to borrow somebody's dreams till tomorrow. There is no other day. Let's try it another way. You'll lose your mind and play. Free games for play. Well, see Emily plays was, I suppose, the height of Sid Barrett's. Um, pop songwriting period with, with Pink Floyd. Uh, it was certainly their biggest hit. It got, number, it got to number six in the charts, and uh, it was a real classic pop song. And of course, with all Sid Barrett songs, there's always a line that kind of stands out and grabs your attention. Emily tries, but misunderstands. Oh, she's often inclined to borrow somebody's dreams till tomorrow. See Emily Play was the biggest hit that the Sid Barrett era Floyd ever had. Now, Sid himself always maintains after a gig one night he fell asleep in the woods after a really heavy trip, man, woke up and saw this girl in the distance playing the Emily of the song. Now, I find this a little hard to believe because the original title of the song was Games for May. So why on earth was it then changed to see Emily play? So it's very possible that never happened. It's also possible it was a dream sequence, or there's a third story, which is the fact that there was someone hanging around with the Floyd at the time, who was very intimately involved with the band, and they actually changed her name to Emily to protect her.
see Emily play, obviously a lot more psychedelic than Arnold Lane. Um, you've got the sort of wacky guitar solos all over it and the uh, plastic ruler being scraped down the neck of the guitar and it sort of noises and that sort of thing. I suppose see Emily play, it's the best sort of encapsulation of what the Floyd were about at that time because they had the, it's a pop song, but at the same time it's a bit of a soundscape. Much more of the, the sort of psychedelic vibe that perhaps had been lacking from, from the first single, Arnold Lane, and um, dipping even more deeply into this English whimsy, um, which was very, very strong and very influential at the time. See Emily Play became a huge chart success. The hype that the record created led to eager anticipation about the group's first LP. However, the album's title was to become somewhat of an issue. The original working title for the album, that's the job file, was Projection. There's a few adverts for Arnold Lane, um, which you, you know, if you look in the magazines and so forth from the time, they talk about the next projected sound for 67. So they were obviously yeah, the record company was sort of thinking along those, those lines for publicity. But fairly late in the day, um, it was Peter Bowne said to me, you know, Sid just sort of came up one day and said, I think you know, we want to go with, we want to use this title, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which he'd got from the Wind in the, it's the odd chapter out in Wind in the Willows. When, when you read The Wind in the Willows, there's this strange chapter which doesn't follow the narrative flow. So I was thinking, murmured the rat, dreamful and languid, Dance music, the lilting sort that runs on without a stop, but with words in it too. It passes into words and out of them again. I catch them at intervals. Then it is dance music once more, and then nothing but the reeds, soft, thin, whispering. You hear better than I, said the mole sadly. I cannot catch the words. The title very much reflects the importance of that innocent, childlike, vibe that uh, Flower Power had. You know, we're talking the summer of 1967 here. It was the Flower Power summer. Piper at the Gates of Dawn was released in August 1967, the height of the summer of love. The record is one of Britain's few psychedelic masterpieces and still has a resonance almost 40 years later. I still find Piper at the Gates of Dawn to be a um, very impressive creation. I and mean, we're talking about a record that was made nearly 40 years ago still stands, no, no question about that at all. For me, Piper of the Gates of Dawn remains the finest work Pink Floyd ever put together. It's a remarkable album. Now, I'm not knocking what they did post uh, Sid Barrett with Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, The Wall. These were wonderful, magnificent pieces of work. But what made Piper of the Gates of Dawn stand apart from so much at the time was that it was eccentric, it was significant, it was eloquent, and all these were combined through Sid Barrett, who was a, a conduit for so much that was going on, so much that was dark, so much that was almost unnerving and a little bit difficult to comprehend. The prime example to me is a song called The Bike On There, which seems a little bit fairy tale, a little bit happy-go-lucky, a little bit watch of mother, if you will, but if you get deep into the roots and what you're actually hearing and listening to is a man opening up his psychosis, opening up his psychology, opening up his disturbed yet quite brilliant mind. I've got a bike, you can ride it if you like, it's got a bass, it's a bell and rings and things to make it look good. I'd give it to you if I could, but I borrowed it. You're the kind of I've got a bike, you can ride it if you like. It's got a bell that rings and things to make it look good. Um, but again, I mean, almost like a nursery rhyme, you know, so we cannot underestimate the importance of this, this sort of fairy, childlike world that uh, at that time hallucinogenic drugs were associated with.
Yes, apart from being a fun, quirky song, bike also has this extraordinary construction. So uh, you get points where it seems to be slowing down at the end of each verse, or the, uh, the lyrics and the structure of it break up in unexpected ways. So you can't really predict which way Sid is going to sing next. But it, yeah, it's got that kind of oblique, sort of unpredictable uh, air about the whole piece, which makes it all the more intriguing, all the more fascinating. For me to listen to it, it's almost a bit uncomfortable, really. I mean, you've got that mad sound collage when he goes off into the room of musical tunes, which is very strange. And uh, the first time, I remember the first time I heard it, I remember thinking, woo, you know, what, what's happening here? You know, you've got all these groovy, uh, almost pop songs and, the, you know, and the, the psychedelic stuff, and then it closes the album with this... It, it, in a way, it's it's... You've got a simple song, but it, it's with a with an oddly nursery rhyme type subject. But in a way, it's, it can be un, it's unsettling. Another song on the album, Interstellar Overdrive, had long been a firm live favourite of the bands and was one of the songs that had earned them their psychedelic reputation. their anthem in a way, it was the piece that people went to hear them play at uh, all the underground clubs who expected them to, to um, you know, get the lights show operating and uh, the Binson Echo Drive was very important on that too because that was a little device that gave uh, Sid Barrett the appropriate echo effects on his guitar. Uh, being a, a nine minute instrumental, uh, it gave uh, all of the group uh, an opportunity to improvise jam it came up with a kind of soundscape, really. It was, a, it was painting, painting with music. Interstellar Overdrive really came out of that, uh, that, that, that need to create these, these sort of improvisational, experimental pieces in, in that live environment. Um, in fact, uh, Pete Jenner tells the story that Interstellar Overdrive first took shape when he was humming to Sid the tune of, I think it was My Little Red Book by Arthur Lee and Love. And Sid picked up the guitar and started copying the, the sort of descending riff as, as Pete was, was humming it. Um, but then from that very simple structure, they created this elongated piece of, of, of sort of space rock, as, as we called it. And interstellar overdrive itself, which is almost, let's go, let's just let our instrumental imagination run riot, again, holds your attention enraptured because it has such a fascinating pull, a magnetic pull to its center. You're driven towards the center of that whole journey, when interstellar overdrive is a journey. And at the end of it, you feel drained and you feel that you're lost, but somehow extraordinary exalted. Piper at the Gates of Dawn was released, Barrett's well-documented mental problems were beginning to become a serious issue for the Pink Floyd. Sid's behaviour was becoming increasingly erratic, and after a disastrous American tour, it was clear that something had to change. However, Sid's condition has, in recent years, been the focus of some debate. It's very easy to say that Sid Barrett was 
an acid casualty. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of other people took LSD uh, without having sort of psychotic breakdowns or whatever. So, I mean, it's become pretty clear over the years that there was already a schizophrenic condition there, and clearly these drugs will accentuate that. Um, on the other hand, I mean, he was take, there's no doubt he was taking absolutely colossal quantities of, of LSD. The interesting thing about Sid Barrett is the sheer amount of things that you read about him that contradict each other. I mean, he's gone down in history as this bloke who was sort of fried on acid the whole time. But more recently, these interviews have come out with people who he lived with who think that probably you could count on two hands the number of times he took acid during 1967. I mean, obviously Sid had his problems, but I don't think it was down to that. I mean, he smoked uh, copious amounts of weed, um, and I don't think the effect of that could be underestimated. You know, he became very paranoid and very much in his own little bubble, and, you know, you could perhaps partly attribute it to that. Um, he also took a lot of mandrax, um, which uh, very, very sort of powerful... I suppose you could say it was a sedative. What that actually was that happened to him, I think it's very hard to say. I mean, I think that's why people find him so fascinating. Despite Sid's deteriorating condition, the group did manage to release a third single, the Barrett composed Apples and Oranges. It's certainly a lot less carefully packaged than CM Replay. It was a product of months of trying to, you know, sort out the follow-up hit and failing. Um, you know, again, I think it's an example of um, the, the kind of pressures that, that, Sid is under, that Sid was under at the time. It was recorded around about November 67, um, which was getting towards the end of Sid's time with the group anyway. Um, and so, you know, they were, they were scratching it. They needed a single to come out. They, there were all sorts of financial pressures on the band. And, you know, Sid was feeling the pressure, perhaps not coming up with the, the songwriting in the way he did before. But, you know, they put this one together. But they, they needed to get a record out for Christmas. As Sid actually said in an interview, you know, it's a chirpy song with a touch of Christmas about it. As so many of his songs were actually rooted in real life and what he saw around him. You know, the story is he saw his girl shopping in Richmond one day and he wrote this song about it. And it's quite prescient because, uh, you know, there's that line in there about she's getting everything from the supermarket. So he's, he's actually seeing the breakdown of that traditional English high street, the butchers, the bakers and the candlestick makers. Now it's all in the superstore, the supermarket. Um, but it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a great song, certainly as a single, and you can see why, why it didn't chart. Sid's not Eric Clapton. He's not one of those sort of guitar players, but he's, he, he creates some great sounds. He's like, like John Lennon, you know, not a, a red-hot lead guitarist, but, you know, boy, he could make it talk, the guitar, when he wanted to. But, we, I mean, Apples and Oranges, it's this amazing wah-wah riff that, that, that drives it. And and it ends on this sort of feedback where, it, and, it, and it's all the, all the way, all the way through, he's playing this, this, this wah-wah guitar and, and you know, he's just holding back the feedback until right at the end and then it just sort of, you know, the song fades out on, 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 that, on that feedback.
rather the tail end of 1967, Sid's increasingly erratic behaviour became too much of a burden for the rest of the group to bear. Sid's status within Pink Floyd began to drastically alter. I mean, there were these stories of, uh, um, you know, him standing on stage all night and playing one note uh, with his back to the audience. I mean, you can see how it became hugely infuriating for the rest of the group. Um, and they decided that they couldn't go on like this. And there had been a series of gigs where he hadn't turned up at all, and Davy O'List from The Nice had depped on, on guitar. Uh, something had to give. And there were various plans. I mean, uh, the Floyd's management had one notion, which was that uh, Sid could become a kind of Brian Wilson figure. Uh, that is, not go on the road with them, not appear on stage with them and, you know, frankly, fuck the gig up every single night. Uh, but hopefully could still provide the material, write the songs in the way that Brian Wilson was at that stage doing with the Beach Boys. The band wanted to keep him on board and they went through this period where... I mean, when Dave, David Gilmore joined, you know, around about December 67, and you know the announcement in the press where he was to you know, help broaden their sound or take it in new directions though what they really needed at the time was somebody who could play guitar reliably um, and do singing and stuff like that um, and Sid was still going to be the songwriter this this seems to be what, what they were saying so they ended up with this strange period for half a dozen gigs at the beginning in 1968 where you have both David Gilmour and Sid Barrett in the band they they did try it with Sid and David Gilmour together but again that didn't work out and there's the the famous story where they just decided for one gig well they weren't going to bother to pick him up and um, that was it they went on to do all the various Pink Floyd things they did and but you know the the upshot of it all was yeah after January 68 Sid was uh, on his own. After the split Barrett initially retired from the public eye however there was to be a peculiar and haunting epitaph to Sid's departure. On Pink Floyd's second LP, Saucer Full of Secrets, released after Sid had left the group, the band decided to include the Barrett-composed Jug Band Blues. And I'm most obliged to you for making it clear that I'm not here And I never knew the moon could be so big And I never knew the moon could be so blue And I'm grateful that you threw away my old shoes and brought me It's a song written by a bloke who seems to be acknowledging what's happening to him. You know, I'm wondering who could be writing this song. And perhaps in Jug Band Blues, you've got a man acknowledging he's not very happy with the way things are at that particular time. Jug Band Blues, it gets held up as this sort of cast iron proof that, that Sid was crazy. I think certainly it's evidence that he, he wasn't happy. You know, it's a very downbeat, possibly slightly angry song in some ways. I think it's a very um, carefully worked out piece. I don't think it was just making it up as he, as he went along. You know, I mean, there's, um, there's um, a version of it in circulation from the BBC session from a few months later, and um, it sounds exactly the same. It's the exact same structure and the exact same lyrics, you know, so I don't think, uh, I don't think it was a random outpouring. Um, I, I, I think it is actually a very carefully constructed piece of work. Unhappy and perhaps it was, it's obviously a fragmented track, it's got all these funny little bits and pieces in it and perhaps, yeah, he was, he was trying to, that was meant to be an expression of his state of mind, that he was being a little bit all over the place. And you've got this you've got this Salvation Army band that suddenly appears out in the middle of nowhere in it, which is which is great. I mean they had they had good fun trying to record that apparently. But the, the story goes, you know, when they came in and they, they wanted to know what to play, Sid just said, we'll play anything. Um, which sounds, you know, you can go back and say, whoa, that's pretty spooky and psychedelic and far out but um, when you think about it what he want what he 
what you've got is a it's it's sort of um you've got this surreal section in the middle and it's like the band are in you know the 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 salvation army band are almost like suddenly flying in from another place and being in there so in that context i suppose you know if you're sid barrett and you're you're writing a you've got a song and he wasn't bothered about what they were going to play he just wanted the salvation army band playing it's a haunting song really jug band blues because that that awareness of what's happening to him is 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 quite uh, quite scary in a way i mean it must have been it must have been a very hard burden to to bear to, to uh, you know it's almost better if, if, if you're cracking up if you're breaking up like that it's almost better to know that it's not going on than to be so acutely aware that that you're falling apart and yet having these flashes of lucidity in which you can actually describe the process of falling apart After leaving Pink Floyd at the beginning of 1968, Barrett had remained silent. After some abortive recording sessions with Peter Jenner in May, it wasn't clear if Sid Barrett was going to pursue a solo career at all. Malcolm Jones, who was head of Harvest Records at the time, just got a call from Sid Barrett one day saying he wanted to come in to, you know, to do some more recording. But Sid came back in and, and played a few numbers from Malcolm Jones and you know there were things like Opal and Swan Lee and whatever that that you know and, and Malcolm Jones felt was it was good you know it was it was strong enough to do the album and from then on there was this fairly leisurely process where Malcolm Jones was producing and they they you know he'd, Sid would do just very basic backing tracks with him and his uh, his the black tele, black telecaster he had at the time and they they didn't plug it in they just mic'd it up and he used it as like an acoustic guitar and when you look through the recording sheets, there's this sort of six month period where they're fiddling with, uh, with the various songs and adding bits and pieces and um, just things are slowly starting to take shape. During this process, it was decided that several of the new recordings needed a band behind them. Barrett eventually approached a contemporary psychedelic group, Soft Machine, and invited them to guest on the new album. We were playing in, uh, in the 100 Club in, in Oxford Street in London. Anyway, after this gig, Outside, um, Sid appeared, he'd been in the gig, and uh, he knew Robert and Mike anyway from earlier days, although I'd never met him before. And he just kind of muttered, you know, would you like to come and play on this record I'm doing? You know, it was kind of very vaguely suggested. So we said, OK. And so we, it was arranged for a, a couple of months later. And Sid definitely didn't want session musicians, which we weren't anyway, so that was not a problem. Um, so I guess he really, he'd heard something when we played live. Um, something about, I suppose, the power or the, the sounds, which, I mean, at that time, we, we, I mean, Soft Machine were quite weird at that time, and we were doing, we were doing written pieces, but, I mean, we were doing it quite heavily and with heavy sounds, so I guess um, he felt that, you know, he automatically heard something which he thought would fit the, his, his, the ambience of his music, and I think that's right. I mean, he wasn't trying to be control freak and have everything delineated as it should be, I mean, or as ever anyone else would. He was thinking more in terms of atmospheres, I think, and kind of feelings. So, I mean, the sound of Soft Machine probably fitted, at that time, fitted into his songs. When we got to Abbey Road Studios, um, Sid had got some demos, just voice and guitar, which we'd never heard before, and he had absolutely no suggestions for us what we should do. So we had to sit down in this very expensive studio and learn these tunes as we were going, and playing along with them, and starting again. And we did our usual thing, lots of fuzz, fuzz bass, fuzz organ, and Robert thundering away on drums. And uh, we still, we were kind of halfway to learning them, because I mean, they're not very easy songs. I mean, they're, oh, they're not compli they're not difficult songs, but they're, they're not symmetrical. So you might have four bars of this and half a beat there and three bars maybe, and then it changes. So we had to learn this. And then after a couple of hours, we'd 
of each song we'd, we'd had a go at this. And uh, Sid came in and said, yeah, that's, uh, that's fine, yeah. And that's it, he was happy, although we felt we hadn't even learned the songs. You know, he felt that, that was something which was okay for him, for his, for the atmosphere of the tune, so that was it. I don't know whether they ran out of money or EMI was starting to question the length of time that the sessions were taking. But the, the, the generally agreed version of the story is that, that after this sort of leisurely six month period of sessions where Malcolm Jones was producing, um, Sid was given like two days to finish the album, yeah, two days of recording to finish the album. So there's one day and I think it, it's David Gilmore and Sid doing Octopus, as we were talking about earlier, plus Golden Hair, which were tracks that Sid had tried recording in 68. Had ended up, the, the recordings from there were very, very loose. David Gilmore got different versions from Sid. He he pushed Sid to come up with much tighter versions of both both recordings. So that's one day, and the second day Roger Waters came in as well uh, to help us producing, and it was literally Sid laid down half a dozen tracks, Dark Globe and If It's In You and uh, a, number, a few like this. Uh, that whole sequence on side two of Madcap Laughs where they've joined three or four songs together. And you, know, you can hear Sid chatting in the studio and he has the full starts and various bits and pieces. All that was done on, on one day. And then there's a day when David Gilmore comes in and mixes everything, um, even all the Malcolm Jones ones and uh, all the stuff he, that he'd recorded um, in the last two days. Then there's a day where Sid and David Gilmore decide what the track's going to be and that's it, that's the album. So you've got like half the albums created in this leisurely six month sort of, you know, very laid back atmosphere and then you've got two days of frantic activity creating the other half. With the album complete, EMI prepared to release what became Sid Barrett's final ever single, Octopus. However, in recent years, the lyrical content of the song has been re-examined. When you first look at the lyrics to Octopus, you thought, where on earth, well, what's he writing about here? This is, this is, this is really wacky stuff. And it, what it transpires, what he's done, he's taken a whole load of lyrics from poetry, poems. There's um, one called The Old Man on the Border, uh, which contributes a lot of the you know, crack by scattered needles and, all the, and the old man on the border that crops up in the lyric. And there's another one about the, the Grasshopper's Band and that's where all that Grasshopper's Green Herbarian band business comes from. And they're, they're all sort of quoted from things like, uh, you know, things like Edward Lear and things like um, Green Grow the Bushes Ho and that sort of thing. Um, the Man on the Border, that's certainly from one of Edward Lear's lyric, uh, limericks, I think. Sid just seems very comfortable with that. I mean, he's created a great backdrop. I mean, it's a really strong song, Octopus. I mean, uh, initially, when, when they first put the running order together for Madcap, the Madcap Laughs, that was going to be the opening song, though they, they later switched the sides around. But it, it's a really strong song, hence the fact it came out as a single. And Sid, again, as the songwriter, he's, he seems comfortable enough, well, you know, I like that, I like that, I'll take a bit of that on, and he stitches them all together in a way that just works. Madcap Laughs was released to substantial success in January 1970. However, elements of the album's production seem to be in direct contrast to what Sid had done previously with Pink Floyd. Well, in many respects, the Madcap Lass, I suppose, was the first under-produced album, whereas up to that point, people, for example, the Beatles, had been desperately trying to, with the, with the help of people like George Martin, were trying to produce ever more uh, polished and imaginative and orchestrated and cleverly arranged albums using all the, the tricks of the studio as well. Session musicians brought in at the drop of a hat. So, <laughs> But what you've got with the Mad Cat, really, or, although there were attempts to use uh, effects, um, mainly you're, you're just getting raw Sid and you're getting 
pauses and mistakes and fluffs. It does have a very sparse sound. Um, you know, there aren't these sort of swirling psychedelic effects and that sort of thing. Um, why is that? I don't know. I mean, um, you know, Sid seems to have called it a day with the sort of weird echo units and that sort of thing after, after Pink Floyd. I mean, maybe what he was trying to say was that really it's the, the songs that are important. Um, I mean, that was what he'd been doing before Pink Floyd, you know. He had his little folder of songs and he'd play his acoustic guitar to people at parties and that sort of thing. Um, and I think there's some interview quote where he says, well, yes, it's just the same as it's always been. It's just me and an acoustic guitar getting the songs done. And perhaps it was the only way that he, he could work by that stage. But it is very interesting that just as uh, recording is going high tech and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, four track didn't come in until uh, the kind of mid 60s and then eight track and 16 track and 32 track. Um, and this is stripped down and raw and, uh, you know, years before anybody had invented the term lo-fi uh, or, uh, you know, people were making records in their bedrooms or, or any of that, um, this record is pointing the way, really. So the way it sounds is just quite extraordinary and completely out of step with almost anything else at the time. I really love you and I mean you The star above you, crystal blue Again, it's what we were saying before about it being a very sparse, quite minimalist sound. You know, you've got him strumming on his uh, on his Telecaster with what you what we can only assume is a very thin, flippy plectrum, because you can hear it hitting the strings louder than you can hear the sound of the strings themselves. You have this ch -ch 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 sort of sound. Um, it's um, Again, it's one of those songs where he's, he's just got such great imagery, these sort of little underwater little vignettes, you know, sort of... Again, which don't quite make sense in a literal kind of way. You've got these sort of phrases sort of bumping into each other, you know, sort of floating, bumping noses, dodger tooth, the fins are luminous. Floating, bumping noses, dodger tooth, the fins are luminous. Fangs all round a clam is dark below the boulders hiding all the sunlight's good for us. When when Sid Barrett did the Madcap Laughs, I think there was a genuine feel on there that what he was doing was allowing his imagination to flow, to take hold. It was as if he was saying, I have this imagination, I don't understand whether it's a part of me or not, but I'm going to let it go. And um, the prime example for me is Terrapin, the opening track of the album. It's got a state of real unnerving dream. It's a definite dream state on the record. You listen to the flow of the words and what he seems to be doing is just laying back and letting it happen. He was capturing it rather like someone made fish, taking it out of the water and then throwing it down on pieces of paper and then seeing what he had at the end. Another element of the album's production has been the cause of much debate over the years since its release. On the second side of the LP, several tracks contain false starts and imperfections that for many only add to the record's charm. Yes, I'm thinking. Yes, I'm thinking. Look, uh, you know, I, 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 I'll start again. I'll start again. It's no, it's just the fact, you know, going through it. I mean, if you, if we could cut... David Gilmour was describing it in an interview. He said they wanted to give a, an idea of what was actually going on in the studio. I'm not, not sure quite what was going through their heads at the time. But when you, when you look at the recording box, it's quite specific. It's the, the, the instructions are that it must be left like this. It's not a case of it was done accidentally or they didn't want to tidy it up or something. It was quite specific. They wanted to leave that 
section in as it was. And and my reaction when I first heard the heard the album wasn't, wow, listen to all that page turn. This is this is strange. It was just like almost like a jokey bit of fun. You know, here's an artist admitting he's you know admitting their foibles and you know that he makes mistakes and he has trouble singing sometimes. Um, and it, and it does work as a sequence. I mean, yeah, perhaps David Gilmour does regret it now, I don't know. But for me, it's an interesting bit of, bit of the album, and I think it works. And it, and it, and it works as a, as a sequence. The, you know, the way they have it on the album, it, it works. And I, you know, I don't think there's any problem with it being included. There, there's no doubt that the realism of the Madcap Laughs is like no other realism of the time. You have to remember, we were li living in an era where artistic integrity overtook everything else. Every wing was living in an unreal world. Suddenly Sid Barrett came along, who was Mr. Unreal for so many people, and did the Madcap Laughs, and what it has on the record are the four starts. It has that moment where things go wrong and he says, no, let's start again. It actually is a diary of the way the record was put together in the studio, which is quite remarkable, because almost any other artist would have said, cut this out, cut that out, I don't want people to hear this. What Barrett said is, no, this is what the record is about. It's about the songs, but it's also about the moments when I get things wrong and what I learn through getting things wrong. And remarkably, it remained so underrated for several years after it came out, and suddenly the punk era came along, and what happened? The punk suddenly elevated Sid Barris to a status that his erstwhile band, Pink Floyd, could never achieve with them because it was real. It was going straight to the heart. It was Sid Barrett, a voice and a guitar, saying, this is who I am, this is what I give you. And the punks took so much on board from that. With Barrett doing hardly any promotion for the madcap laughs, sessions for a second solo LP started almost immediately in February 1970. However, these sessions were to be very different to those of the previous album. Well, Mad Cat Last was uh, a marginal success. It, at least it got uh, Sid Barrett back working and being, uh, showing that he really did want to create a solo career after leaving Pink Floyd. But um, I think people felt that he really needed a push to m produce some work that was more um, organised for the second album. And this is where his old friend Dave Gilmore came into play involved right from the start and I think he he went for a much more structured approach um, than perhaps Malcolm Jones had gone. Malcolm Jones I think had let Sid drive the product the process. I think David David Gilmore took a much more active producer's role. Um, but again, I mean they started off with just Sid and his guitar and you know you talk to the engineers and it was basically recording just tracks with Sid and an acoustic guitar and then they overdub all the instruments on top of that. I think the difference this time around was that David Gilmour would push Sid more to, to try and get a, a best performance from it. I mean you, you could say in a way he did add, he, you know there, there's there are chunks of David Gilmour on that album rather than Sid Barrett simply because as he said you know Sid had finished a number and that was it he'd stop singing and that would it he'd stop playing so you know, he'd have to add, to, to, to finish the song off, he'd have to add a long fade out. And there, there's, you know, at least one point on that album where, you know, it, it's the, you know, it's David Gilmore, Rick White and Jerry Shirley jamming in the studio just to finish the, you know, give a, a reasonable fade out to, to something that, that Sid had uh, created the basic structure for. Even though the more rigid format of the Barrett sessions ensured that the record was released a mere nine months after the Madcap Laughs in November 1970, it also stripped the record of some of the innovative features that had made Sid's first solo effort so unique. Barrett is a much more lush, fleshed out sounding album. I think it's, uh, I think Dave Gilmore who produced it obviously made a real effort to make it sound like a real sort of finished product. I think he was maybe aware of the, the, the flaws that, that Madcap have. Um, but I mean, I, I wonder if it went a little bit too far the other way. It's trying too hard to be a conventional record that you might get played on the radio. Uh, that's, that's the problem with it. I mean, there are flashes of, of great songwriting in there, um, but it does, doesn't have... And you have to be careful not to romanticise it uh, and say, the great thing about Mad Cat Last is because it is so mad and Sid is so out there. But in a way, that is true. And when you try and confine that uh, crazy genius into a more conventional format that, as I say, might even get you on the radio, 
uh, I think you've got problems and that's what you hear on that record. For me, the second Sid Barrett solo album, Barrett, is it, not really about him. It's too focused, too commercial, too smooth. Yes, the songs are fabulous. Yes, it's probably better as a body of work than the Madcap Laughs. However, because other influences were being brought to bear, outside pressures from producers like uh, Roger Waters, with, uh, with Dave Gilmore, with uh, Richard Wright, and Ian Mai's influence was there because they were running scared as to exactly what Sid Barrett was going to come up with if he was allowed just to reign free, as it were. So they imposed, and by imposing their own parameters and the parameters of the musicians he worked with, I think what you end up with is an album that's terribly disappointing. Nonetheless, Barrett does contain some memorable and striking songs. Among them, Baby Lemonade, Gigolo Aunt and the enigmatic Dominoes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's melancholic, but it's lovely. It's and it's a great image. And you and I and Dominoes, I don't know who who is it? Who's he? Who's he talking to? Certainly, one of the most successful pieces off that album, uh, for my money. It's it's, a, it's such a simple song. I mean, I think that the actual verse. It's almost just all on one chord, and the, the actual the backing, you know, from despite what we were saying before about you know the production maybe being a bit questionable, I think it works very well on that on that particular one. Um, again, with the sort of the long droney organs and the sort of weird phasing on the drums, I think it's it's. Uh, I think that's yeah, very very sort of sympathetic to the song. was greeted with a lot less enthusiasm than the madcap laughs. After the album failed to chart, Sid retreated to the sanctuary of his hometown of Cambridge, and after several aborted attempts to perform and record, finally vanished from public life altogether. To this day, he lives a reclusive life in Cambridge, shunning press and having little to do with the music that made him famous. However, in his absence, his legend has continued to grow. It has been further fueled by the appearance of several compilation albums containing previously unreleased material. One of the best loved of these rare tracks is Opal, which was made available in October 1988, a full 18 years after the release of his final album. On a distant shore, miles from land, stands the ebony totem in ebony sand, a dream in a mist of grey. The pebble that stood alone in driftwood lies half buried. Warm, shallow water sweeps shells, so the cockle shines. Opal is a song that I feel represents one of the finest moments in Sid Barrett's songwriting and musicianship career, to call it musicianship career, if you will. And one of the reasons is it's so un unnerving and unpredictable. You never quite know what you're going to get. Even the title itself says nothing except, here's a song, just listen to it. Sid Barrett always had that ability to let his imagination run riot and if he was allowed to do that, what he ended up with was a stream of consciousness that was almost, almost to the point of being completely ridiculous, yet strangely was focused, strangely was a raging storm with a sense of calm right at its centre. Weird, weird chords. Um, I mean, whether that's just because his guitar was somewhat out of tune that day, I don't know. But these, um, 
it goes into this sort of long sort of instrumental section. You could almost sort of imagine a, a string quartet playing it, you know, these sort of these sort of desolate, long, drawn out chords. Um, and again, sort of, you know, more more of more of that sort of wonderful imagery, you know, a, a dream in a mist of grey. I mean it is it's an amazing song. I mean it, the imagery on a you know on a far distant shore and it's one of those where it conjures up these amazing pictures. He was a craftsman. He was a, he was a he was a great craftsman as a songwriter. And uh, ultimately, I think that's what his his legend rests on. It's his it's his songwriting. You can hang all the other stuff on it as well if you want. But you strip all that away and you listen to the songs, and they're still great songs. And and that to me is what Sid Barrett's about. And that is why people still talk about Sid Barrett and why people still buy his recordings and still listen to them. I feel that the one album that Sid Barrett did with Pink Floyd, Piper of the Gates of Dawn, plus his two solo albums, really encapsulate brilliantly what that man was all about in a certain sense of his life. Four years, three albums, that's all it is, but it really does still capture the imagination because this is Sid Barrett. He was an extraordinary figure and an extraordinary songwriter uh, who in a very brief period of time uh, made a remarkable impact on English pop music. But no answer came. He looked and understood the silence. With a smile of much happiness on his face and something of a listening look still lingering there, the weary rat was fast asleep. <laughs> <laughs>